college education is the key to the American dream. But today, something's wrong. Students don't read, period. How can they survive? It is market-driven. So commercialized. You know, I got swallowed up. Powerful forces are driving higher education in new directions. I'm John Merrow. What we're going to show you, both good and bad, about colleges and universities can be found on virtually every campus in America. Principal support for this program is provided by Lumina Foundation for Education. Additional support was provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with additional funding by Park Foundation, Christian A. Johnson Endeavor Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and the Spencer Foundation. Going off to college, it's a rite of passage for millions every fall. It's really exciting because I've been looking forward to this for a long time, so I'm just glad to finally be here and move again. More than 14 million undergraduates at 4,200 colleges following a dream. There's still a romance about higher education. It's still not only a way up for some people, uh, it's a way of making sure that you've been stamped by society uh, for future success. So college is partly a ritual, a transition. It's also a way of people beginning to move out of the family. So there's still a pretty positive sense of it's part of the American dream. It's a growth experience. It's about building confidence, building your communication skills, learning to work with people, learning about other cultures, other backgrounds. I'm really excited, a little bit nervous since we just got here and stuff, but pretty excited about the whole college experience and everything. A very few years ago, it was possible to graduate from high school and get a job that could sustain a family and even sustain a middle class standard of living in the United States. Those days are over. Never again will we see that time. College education is an absolute necessity for any individual to enter and stay in the American middle class. But even with college in necessity, there are warning signs that all is not well in higher education. Drinking has always been a problem on campus, but today, 39% of students admit to binge drinking. That's weak. One more. The debate over the role of sports on campus persists. It's not illegal for a coach to make $2 million a year and professors to make only 100,000. But is it right? Is it moral? Is it ethical, and does it help education? 68% of today's college students are working at least 15 hours a week. 20% hold down full-time jobs while trying to be full-time students. Do you miss class? I frequently do. When you are dead tired, you don't hear that alarm. I don't care how loud it is, you sleep right through it, and that's happened. Does anybody have any comments or questions? 44% or... of today's college faculty are part-time teachers. This man teaches at three colleges. I'm pretty much an assembly line kind of a guy. I wish I could tailor make my delivery. Can't do it. Too many students, too many classes. And teaching is often not a priority. Clearly, if I want to raise, it's going to be through research. I'm not going to get raises based on quality of teaching, no matter how good that teaching is. Students who start may not finish. On average, almost half of students at four-year colleges leave without graduating. Most disturbing of all is what's being said about those who do graduate. There's been report after report and commission after commission formed of business leaders who are calling out to higher education and saying, we need to change the system. Um, we are not satisfied with the level of skills that our employees are showing up with. And, and this has implications for defense. 
It has implications for competing in internationally economically. It has implications for what it means to, to run local government for people becoming taxpayers. And yet, other than concerns about cost, the public seems satisfied with higher education. That's because the American public has very little information. We don't really have any information that tells us how good higher education is from the standpoint of student learning. We know kids go to college. We don't know whether they actually learn anything while they're there. We have no idea, really, what goes on at most colleges and universities. We make huge assumptions that something magical happens in four years, but we really don't know. You ready for this? Oh, yeah. I'm ready to move in, but I say about two weeks, I'll be ready to come back home, probably. We met freshman Matt Morris on his first day at Western Kentucky University, which enrolls more than 18,000 students, the vast majority of them from the region. Uh, it's just a bit overwhelming, I guess, just all the people, because I'm from town, about 400 people. It's a big change. It's going to be a big change. In high school, Matt spent his weekends drag racing. He admits he's not well prepared for college. I could have been a straight-A student in high school if I was A-B without bringing a book home. So I don't know. I'll study a lot, though, because I don't have very good study skills. Matt is the first in his family to go to college. His dad works at UPS. His mom is a homemaker. You have to understand that Matt never was the type to buckle down on academics. He concentrated in sports. Um, so this is a big change for him. He's never had the uh, study ethics or whatever you want to call it. Still, Matt has high hopes. Welcome to the class of 2008. You know, it was kind of 50-50 whether I wanted to go to college, but I think in the long run, it'll be worth it so I can get me a good job. I want to have a nice race car, a nice house. I figure if I can make $60,000, $70,000 a year by myself, I can have pretty much anything I want. What classes are you taking? Uh, Western Civ, computer-aided drafting, English, bowling, uh, astronomy, and university experience. That's kind of about as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a wide array of classes you can get, I'd say. Sounds challenging, you know? also. Uh, it'd be pretty tough, I'd say, but I got a lot of free time, so might as well use it. Western Kentucky's mission is to serve the state and its high school graduates. I want a degree in their hands so that they're credentialed so they can get a better job and continue to improve the quality of life for the rest of their life. The state invests $75 million a year in this university, and the payoff is a talented workforce, an improved quality of life, and an, econ and an economy that's being driven by our universities. Most colleges accept at least three quarters of those who apply. Western Kentucky accepts 93%. That has an impact on the classroom. All right, uh, we're going to continue today with the monetary policy. Minimum. The professor is Brian Strau, an award-winning teacher. Now, what if we changed it? What if the Federal Open Market Committee woke up one day and says, you know what, this 0.1 or 10% reserve requirement, uh, maybe that's, that's too low. I'm here because I enjoy the classroom. I enjoy turning the little light bulb on in the students' heads, and they say, oh, economics isn't quite as boring as I thought it was. This is, this is somewhat interesting. This is on the news all the time. Now they got an extra $100 in cash sitting around. The bank was previously fully loaned out, didn't really want to sit on extra cash. What's it probably going to do with the money now? Yeah, loans are going to increase by 100 bucks. Professor Strau teaches three courses with a total of 134 students. His Introduction to Macroeconomics course meets three times a week. I've got students in that class who I'm confident would excel at any Ivy League institution, uh, all the way down to students that I'm surprised they let out of high school. To accommodate the range of abilities of his students, Professor Strau makes the first of a number of small compromises. His textbook is optional. But I call it optional in the sense that I'm not going to ask them questions specifically on the test that come out of the textbook. Anyone got an economist on them? All right. 
Instead, he assigns five articles a week from a magazine, The Economist. Third article is on page 55, uh, education in mediocrity. It has to do with the Great Britain's educational system. I would like for uh, students to see an issue that we talk about in class, see it in the world, just independently ask questions, bring that back into class, say, hey, what about this? Because I saw this on the news the other day. How does that fit into what we're doing? Uh, it doesn't generally happen uh, in my class. I wish it did. When it comes to grading, Strau makes another compromise. I end up having to have a pretty big curve because the average is about a 55 out of 100. That's the average for the class. Now, I have students scoring 96, 94, but I've still had people in the 40s, uh, a large number of people in the 40s and the 50s. And so in order to retain them, I guess the 50 magically becomes a C. And there's a huge amount of grade inflation. So what does an A mean? What does a B mean? We know now, for example, that 50, 60 percent of grades are B or better. It used to be that 50 percent of the grades were C's. Now, are the students that much brighter? There's evidence that they actually are not as well prepared in high school as they were before. At elite colleges where students are well prepared, grade inflation continues to be an issue. Well, let's, let's say a word about the exercises first. William Pritchard has been teaching English literature at Amherst College in Western Massachusetts for 47 years. I probably don't give a C now unless it's a student with a real, with a real writing problem, and there are such, or someone who, who hasn't done the work or done it in the most perfunctory way. C Whereas a C used to be a passing grade. You know, I got a couple of C's. <laughs> and, um, the gentleman C. That's what it was called, you know. Now a C is the equivalent of an F? I think a C is the equivalent of a, a strong statement that you've done poorly in this course, yeah. In Mexico, demand is given by price is equal to 130. Would you, as a faculty member, get pressure if you started failing a lot of students? If I started failing 50 percent, then yes. It's retention, retention, retention is what we focus on. And, and for valid reasons, a lot of our students are first-time college students, that is, the, the first ones in their family to ever go to college. I asked the a professor about grading on a curve mm -hmm. and so on. And he said that's because President Ransdell says retention, retention, retention. The Commonwealth of Kentucky tells President Ransdell your budget will be based on how many you enroll, retain, and graduate. Is, is there a danger? If he wants to get paid, he's going to retain students. It does us no good and it does the Commonwealth of Kentucky no good for a student to enroll and leave. <laughs> Three weeks into his first semester, freshman Matt Morris is finding the work challenging. Today, he's facing his first test in astronomy. Astronomy test is over like two chapters. This is one of them things where you're just like, well, I mean, I wish you'd tell us what was on the test, but they don't do it here. In high school, they'll give you a study guide and show you. But no, not for that. Well, I passed my test. Barely. Friggin' 62, but I got uh, 12 points in the extra credit that I can get, so I'm sitting down to work on that, so. Yes, Mom. Passing, barely. Yes, Mother. I'm doing more extra credit. My mom and dad. Ah, uh, they don't want me to fail. Yes, Mom. I won't fail. I won't let myself fail. I mean, I know that, but... They're just kind of worried that I get up here and goof off and everything. I mean, hard thing. Nationally, about one in four students does not make it to sophomore year. No one expects to be a casualty, but it does happen. At the age of 18, you think you're top of the world, but you come out and uh, you hit a large campus like the U of A, it was totally different. Um, you know, I got swallowed up. Didn't know where any of my classes were. It was such a large campus, so much expected out of you. It was just a whole new field, new game. Keith Kaywood came to the University of Arizona from Enid, Oklahoma. He thought he was ready. I first realized that I didn't have the tools uh, needed for college when I went to my first math class and opened that book and looked at some of those equations, and I just didn't have a clue. A few other people in the class, like, just as dumbfounded as I surely was. 
uh, other people there chuckling, already had their pencils out, uh, chugging away on these uh, equations. Right, which was what? It also upset Keith that many of his classes were taught by graduate teaching assistants, not Good. professors, using TAs as a common practice at large universities. Uh, TAs were our teachers. We never actually saw a real professor or anything. These are people three or four years older than I am telling me how it's supposed to be. Even more difficult for Keith was trying to find his place in large classes. My classes were huge, 150, 200 people. You know, no one knew if I was there or not. That's probably a legitimate criticism for reasons that are essentially economic. It's the nature of the learning experience in a large research university, public research university, that there have to be efficiencies in educating young people, and they have to have large classrooms for that purpose. The taste buds are actually top down. Large classes may make economic sense, but experts say they are not the best way to teach. The continuous droning of lecture is, uh, is a surefire way to kind of uh, kill brain cells, I think. I mean, we, we worry about alcohol, but there's very little going on during a lecture that is remotely accessible to them. One of the challenges, of course, is that not every youngster is so disciplined that they can sit in an auditorium and really listen to even a brilliant speech, even a brilliant oration by an extraordinary professor. That's hard for them. What the votes are. The classes, you know, you're just a name on a piece of paper. You know, 200 people, you can sit back there, you can fall asleep. Out of the 430 I wish the college was there to keep a, a check on you, make sure you don't just get lost in the system or fade out. Academic counseling was available, but unfortunately, Keith and others like him often don't realize they need help until late in the game. When I started hearing about these programs, I was already too deep in it, already failing my classes. So at that point, I decided to leave college. Many people drop out not because they're not intelligent enough to succeed, but because they don't have whatever the heck it takes to push themselves through this place, to take the rough, the rough uh, hits and somehow survive. The traditional way that the American public has looked at this and it's documented in public opinion research is that if you go into a school, a high school, and nobody's learning anything or practically no one's graduating, uh, that's the school's problem. You say, get me the principal, get me the school board, get me the parents, get me the state, let's put this thing into receivership. If you walk into a college and see the same thing at a, a 50 or 60 percent uh, completion rate, you say, what's wrong with these students anyway? We gave them the chance to go to college and they're not making it. The year Keith K. Wood dropped out, Arizona lost 22 percent of its freshman class. Today, Keith is managing a bar near campus and often pours drinks for former classmates. Uh, I felt happy for those friends who have graduated. And, uh, but at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm happy where I'm at. Uh, I'm not settling. I'm still uh, moving forward in my field. And I'm acquiring the knowledge that I need. I'm just going a different, uh, different route. I always knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was independent, I was going to go get it, and I was just going to do amazing things. Brittany Schmidt grew up in the foothills of Tucson, not far from the University of Arizona. She and Keith Kaywood were in the same freshman class. <laughs> I got to this place, and I, I had one class that was really, really incredible, and I really felt like I was a part of something, and it was, it was really, really nice. But by the middle of freshman year, when her favorite class ended, some of the same obstacles that derailed Keith had her floundering. I had a lecture that had, you know, 150 people in it. I was frustrated because I didn't have anything that really kept me wanting to come to campus. The instructors were more interested in research, and they'd come for an hour or give their lectures, even if it was a good lecture, and then, you know, they leave and do their thing. I wasn't doing badly. The problem was it just wasn't what I wanted to do because I wasn't being challenged. I wasn't really thinking about things. From there, Brittany's situation only got worse. Eventually, I kind of had this identity crisis. I was just like, you know, I have no idea who I am, what I'm going to do. I don't know what I want to do. And it's, that was really alarming. Brittany made plans to transfer, but before she could, the university's requirement that all students take a wide array of classes 
landed her in an introductory course in planetary science. Her teacher was Dr. Robert Brown, a team leader on NASA's Cassini mission to Saturn. Brittany didn't really express strong interest in being a scientist. She just expressed interest in wanting to push herself. That quality is rarer than you think. We want to evacuate this portion, so open this valve so we can pull that air through the system that we just put in. What actually happened was I, I got to spend a lot of time with Dr. Brown asking him questions, and it just really started to change the way I was thinking. One day, uh, Dr. Brown sat me down and said, look, you're independent enough to come in and talk to me about this, to ask questions. You're obviously interested in it. And in my experience, that level of independence is something that does really well in science, and it seems like you really like it. You should really think about giving it a go. Okay. Brittany Schmidt graduated in May 2005 and is going to graduate school at UCLA to study space and planetary physics. Time is just a little bit of encouragement makes all the difference. But yes, I'm proud of Brittany, but I don't take much credit for that. That belongs to Brittany, that doesn't belong to me. In the course of their time here, in unpredictable ways, maybe a late night in a residence hall with a fellow student, maybe in a chemistry lab, maybe in a small seminar, these young people discover something, usually in themselves, that they didn't know was there. And that's how they grow. What's beautiful about higher education at its best, it is magical. But not magic that can't be explained. It is something that, in fact, we can do on purpose. But because it's as rare as it is, is uh, appears to be magical, but ought to be made more commonplace, because that's what we're about. So the goal of education is an identity crisis, and... <laughs> it's not really the goal is to have an identity crisis, but I think that more students should come in, even if they're a really successful student in some type of field, should come in with a little bit more open mind as to, I'm 18 years old, I don't have to have figured out what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. You learn much more by being out of your comfort zone, so... I don't really think of it as changing. I think of it as growing. Yo. What up, son? What are you doing? When you go to college, people tell you, oh, you don't need to go to class. You know, that's the great thing about college compared to high school. High school, they take attendance. They don't take attendance here. Robin Bahala, a senior, came to the University of Arizona from Southern California. So I always had someone to tell me what to do, you know? I wasn't really an independent kid. I came out here, I'm like, okay, I'm living on my own. My parents are, you know, a thousand miles away, 500 miles away. I mean, other than phone calls, they, they can't really, like, watch me what I'm doing. Robin discovered that no one on campus was paying much attention either. No one's going to stop and be like, you know, OK, this is what you need to do for the rest of the semester to get a good grade. It's not how it is. It's just like, here's what you got to do. I'm not going to watch you. Turn it in if you want. If you don't turn it in, I don't care. It's just going to affect your grade at the end. A lot of responsibility. Lots of responsibility. Were and you... I wasn't used to it because without someone constantly nagging me to do my homework, I, I'm not going to do it, you know? So for a long time, I'd wait till the last minute, try and finish everything at the last minute, probably not do too well. You know, my studying habits were just... I didn't have any. I, I didn't know how to study. Robin quickly figured out what he had to do to get by. Teachers always say, you know, read this and this and this. For every class, you should have a certain amount of readings done. I never do that. Like, towards the end of the class, I'd just start, like, scanning, browsing the readings or looking at my notes to see what the teacher said was important from the notes and then read those parts of the readings. And I usually do fine. I have an 8 to 10 page paper due on Monday. I'm not really sure what it's on. <laughs> it's it's got to be, like, on a, a hardship of slavery, but, like, I think it's got to be, like, a narrative. I'll probably start tomorrow. Tests, I'll study the night before a couple hours. Towards the end of the class, I start like browsing the readings. And lots of teachers give out study reviews and study guides for tests that make it easier, you know? Doing fairly well without much effort, Robin had lots of time to pursue other interests. I'm so wasted already. <laughs> How much do you party? I'd say like four nights a week Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Salud! 
to a night not worth remembering. Exactly. You party hard. I, I, I do party hard. I like to get drunk, not blackout drunk, but I like to get drunk, it's fun. Damn, I'm hurting. You're, you're more loose, you're able to talk to girls easier. And I like girls, so I mean. <laughs> and maybe you'll meet girls during the day, but usually when you do meet, the whole purpose is, okay, yeah, we should hang out at night and go drink and do this or go do, you know? Despite his long nights of drinking, his overall grade point average, Robin says, is 2.85. Obviously, I've done a lot of bad things in four years, but I'm getting a diploma. I made dean's list last semester. Are you beating the system? I don't know if I'm beating it. I think I'm working with it. I'm definitely manipulating it. I just received the hard copy of the paper you put in my box. I'm going to deduct 10 points for lateness, even though I use my excuse of food poisoning and, <laughs> and sickness. I guess it didn't work. She's really pretty lenient, but I guess she's tired of my bulk compliance. In some sense, this is a learned set of behaviors. Students may not realize they've learned it or are learning it, but they're being rewarded for it in many ways. Not have to do a lot of work, still get a B. Buy a paper on the internet, not get caught, um, no big deal. Join a fraternity or not and, and party five days a week and then brag that um, being smashed was a wonderful time and I still made it through my class. This is being learned and they get victimized by it. Robin? Uh, the mitigating circumstances? No. Third, no. <laughs> no, Robin. You presented no mitigators. Yo. Let's focus away from... A sizable number of students are enrolled, stay enrolled, and graduate from college, having been required to put forth relatively little effort in their studies. You know, they know how the system works. This is particularly true at larger universities where one can be anonymous, essentially, and many students go to large universities for that reason. They want to be anonymous. Uh, and so they'll pick large classes, and they tend then to hang together. And so you've got this mass of people kind of sleepwalking, if you will, through college. Ku's organization has surveyed almost 900,000 undergraduates at 1,000 colleges. He says that about 20% of students are drifting through college. A lot of people just try and coast by and don't do the readings, try and, you know, cheat off the, the homework, copy their friends. I actually need to study for a test. Our quiz tomorrow. I think I might just sit next to a smart girl and cheat because I don't know what to read. <laughs> <laughs> Work last time. Some call it sleepwalking. Former college president Richard Hirsch describes these students in a different way. It's sink, tread water, or swim. And in some sense, we've taught people how to tread water. They have functionally stayed in place and have the appearance of movement. That's the crime. Treading water is a reality everywhere. This is a class at Western Kentucky. Well, how, how many of you study an hour a night or, or less? I study an hour in general. I'll just review notes for the day and go on. I don't, a lot of my classes right now don't have homework. So in here, it's just lecture and you just review your lecture notes. Nationally, more than half of students surveyed report they study 15 hours or less a week. There's an academic mantra that's been around probably for centuries. Students ought to spend at least two hours preparing for class for every hour inside the classroom. And uh, they don't. I mean, last night didn't do anything. Monday night didn't do anything. Over the weekend, I didn't do any sort of studying. What do you do with the rest of your time? I just hang out with my friends. And you know, I don't really have a, I don't have a job or anything. I just do my own thing kind of thing. And what is your own thing? What is that? I just you know hang out with my friends, read books, kind of. Do nothing really. Is that the purpose of college? <clears throat> well, you know, I get good grades, so it doesn't seem like I don't really need to study that much to get good grades. I mean, what, just, what's your GPA? Um, it's like a 3.6 ish, you know. What do you do with your time? I mean, I, I play sports and work <laughs> out and stuff, but other than that, that's it. What's your GPA? 3.4. Who are they? How can they survive? Uh, many of them are doing 
at least passable and sometimes much more than passable work. Uh, this is, um, if it's not higher education's dirty little secret, um, it ought to be. What's your GPA? A 298. Is, is that okay? It's okay with me. However, if students do get by, now we got a problem with, we're back to this kind of faculty issue. Who's holding this person accountable? What is the, what is the standard? All political regimes, that includes the regimes of the Saddam Husseins in this world, are concerned with economic growth, are concerned with redistribution. Paulette Kurzer has been teaching political science at the University of Arizona for 11 years. Her Introduction to Comparative Politics class has 225 students. Any flaw in this? No. Zero flaws. The only thing that matters here is politics with a capital P. Do you like teaching? Yeah, I like teaching. Of course, I like teaching. I like, I like my work. Ah, you should know. You don't know? But Professor Kurzer is unhappy with her students. It's not the, yeah, not the World Bank. That's for development countries. They know nothing. When it comes to geography, there is... Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, it doesn't matter. I give them quizzes, but I don't grade them. So I ask them, how many people live in India? Now, remember, this is after they were supposed to read the chapter on India, okay? Remember. So I get back. 14 million... 20 million, <laughs> 30 million, Increases. 2 billion. <laughs> Did you read for today? No, of course not. Did not read, but he still thinks it's unfortunate. You see, if you had read it, you would have understood that we already covered a lot of that material. Every lecture I ask them if they've done the reading. 220 students, maybe five will say they've done the reading. They don't, they're not even embarrassed to admit they haven't done the reading. You have office hours. Do students come see you? Never. Never? Well, no. I should correct myself. I probably have seen three students. All three of them came with a piece of paper that I had to sign because they were withdrawing from the course after the official drop ad period. So that was the first and the last time I saw them. Those are the only students I've seen. Paulette Kurzer's political science class meets three times a week, twice for her lectures, and once in small discussion groups led by teaching assistants. What does this mean and why do they, do they need the confidence of parliament? You have no idea how hard we have to work, that is me and my three graduate students, in having a discussion in the discussion sections. What are some things that might not be so desirable about this system of government? government? It's a discussion section. There's no lecture there. And they just sit there. They sit. Uh, how many of you did the reading for this discussion class? So, two and a half. <laughs> Why? The class is just easy for me. I did the reading on the last, all I did last test was read. I didn't go to the lectures at all, and I got a 90 on the test, so. Yeah, um, sometimes you have other things to do in the week. You have other tests to study for, and you have so many other classes. Of course you have the classes, but you do have this class too. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is just as important as other classes, and it really doesn't take that much time to read two or three questions. You know, the year is winding down, so. It's early I, April. We only have like a month left of school, like three weeks. Are you disappointed? <laughs> you know, by now I'm just blasé. I just, <laughs> I, I just take it for granted that most students don't read and don't do their, their work. Overheating of the economy. Overheating means that the economy is at very close to full capacity. There's no room for further expansion. I think, this is for the sake of argument, students are not demanding because you professors are so boring that you don't bring it to life. And they don't know enough to be angry that they're just being droned at. 
Wow. You're just the devil's advocate, so I'll continue to talk to you. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm boring. And, and the students know that I invest a lot of my lectures, and that's very clear. I've sat in a few lectures now, a couple of yours, yeah. others. Yes. Only one time did I hear a professor say, is that clear? Anybody have any questions? You never did that. The other people didn't do it, just one person. Um, so maybe this is... You know, maybe this is a problem with the, from the teaching, teaching point of view. Well, it could be a problem in a big lecture course uh, and 230 students. It's, it's hard to stop and ask whether it's clear or not. Why is that hard to stop? Mm, because it's just a lecture format. You don't see what is happening. And, you know, it's not kindergarten. They're adults. Mm -hmm. If you failed more students, would that reflect on you? Yes, I'm afraid so. Yeah. I think if I come across as really very strict and uh, rigid and inflexible, especially in political science where the majority of students are male and not female, uh, my reputation would be just of a, you know, a not nice person. If a man does it, they get respect and authority. But if I would do it, uh, I'm afraid I would have the reputation of being a super bitch. Of the 200 students who completed her course, 62% received either an A or a B. Only a handful flunked. There's an unspoken social contract um, that may not even be conscious, but it goes something like this. You don't bother me, I won't bother you. I won't ask much of you, you don't ask much of me. And, and, and that's exactly what happened. It's a pact, it's a contract, it's an agreement. They don't do a lot of work. They don't display a lot of curiosity. They don't express a lot of interest. You don't place demands on me, and I don't place demands on you. And we have kind of a peace there. That's the pact. That's the pact. But the level of frustration. Do your colleagues share your level oh, of frustration? Of course. Of course. Some students aren't happy with their side of the pact. These Western Kentucky undergraduates expected college to be more challenging. Teachers in high school and teachers in middle school would always make college out to be like, oh, wait till you get to college, you know? Take notes, because wait till you get to college. Well, I'm here now, and it's, it's, not what it, it's not as hard as I expected it to be, so. What is striking to me is that students starting college, no matter what type of institution you're talking about, expect to read more, expect to write more. You know, some students can get through their first year of college at large, particularly large institutions, and not have written a paper. I've done maybe two term papers here at college, and that's it. And that was a big surprise to me, because all my teachers told me that, you know, you have to do these papers right. You have to do it like this, because when you get to college, you're just going to be, there's going to be tons and tons of papers that you have to do, which I've only done two. My experience has been, at every grade level, whether it's high school, junior high school, grade school, or college, is that students respond to challenge. They respond to being asked to become the best they can be. If a, if a teacher says, this is not good enough, I know you can do better, um, people rise to the occasion. That's really what people expect and want in some private way. But when they don't get it, they don't run and say, I'm not getting it, please give it to me. They say, this is a pretty good deal. I don't have to do much work. I can get A's, I'll get my degree, and I'll have the semblance of an education. You can't get people to be upset about something they don't know they're missing. You know, if you think about it as far as uh, not being challenged enough, I guess that could be kind of a problem, but I don't, I'm not, I can't say I'm disappointed because I'm having such a great time being here. Would you, so. would you mind if college demanded more of you? Um, I kind of wish it, I wish it did just to give me more of a challenge um, in life because I think, you know, you're going to be faced with challenges in life as you, you know, as you go through life. So I think it would be better to have more challenges with students now so it can help us in the future. Without challenges, students live for the moment. There's so much out there to experience that just sitting in a library reading books all day, you're not going to be able to experience. You got to, you know, grab life by the horns. If you want to point to a tragedy in American higher education, it's that a lot of these folks are getting through college with the same degree other students 
have. But they've not experienced, they've not sampled the curriculum, they've not sampled the cultural events and affairs on campus. They put very little time and, and energy into their own, into their own studies, uh, and, and yet they are there. Any regrets about all of this? None. At my age and at my point in life right now, I'm 22, I'm in college. You know, these are the years that I'm not gonna have back. And I don't wanna be 40 or 50 looking back, you know, I wish I had, I had partied then because I can't do it now. It's really unforgiving that an institution doesn't identify these students and find some way of reaching them. These are not bad people, by the way. These are people with enormous potential and talent, uh, and there are ways of reaching them. We just need to identify and then figure out how to get to them. Robin Bahala graduated from the University of Arizona in December 2004 and moved to Miami, where, he reports, he is working for a pharmaceutical sales firm. Today we're going to talk about clusters of galaxies, or galaxy clusters. We have broken down clusters into two types. We refer to two types of clusters. The first are the rich clusters. Tom Fleming wow. knows how to reach his students. He frequently interrupts to find out whether they're following what he's Anyone. saying. Genevieve, would you like to venture a guess what we call the other class of clusters? Poor. Poor, very good. I can sit here and rant and rave and complain that, oh, our standards are low and that students don't learn in high school what they used to. But the fact of the matter is I have 135 students there now, and I can't go back and change history uh, as to what sort of high school education they received. They're here, they're paying their tuition money. As I tell them on the first day of class, I'm gonna give you your money's worth. Look at the two galaxies on the animation in the left. Notice that the least massive galaxy, first of all, isn't as bright. The students in my class are fine arts majors in business. They're taking this because they're told you should have nine units of science to be a well-rounded person. So these are people that aren't going to become scientists. So I feel that I need to meet them halfway. He does that by giving them radio responders. That allows him to get immediate feedback. So what I'd like to do now is let's go to a question. And don't worry, I'll post this on the website after class. Which of the following is least easily explainable as a result of collision between galaxies? Has everyone answered? Interesting. Half of you think it's number four. Some galaxies seem to be undergoing bursts of star formation, but not everyone agrees. So here's what I want you to do. Start talking about it. If you think you know the right answer, convince your classmate that you've got the right answer. So if two galaxies smash into each other, that's something pretty big. That's number three. Number three? The goal in my class is for them to learn how to solve problems. You know, there's some people saying, oh, well, you're just, you know, um, putting a happy face on the class, making it uh, a circus or something that's fun. Well, you know, I do subscribe to the Mary Poppins principle. A spoonful of sugar does help the medicine go down. But don't for a minute think that I have lowered the standards of my class or that I am not getting the students to think critically. Are we ready to try again? Let's see how many people changed their mind. And this time, the correct answer will be highlighted in red. I changed mine at the last second. That's sweet. <laughs> at least more of you got to the right answer. Let me just give you a brief explanation. Here's a person who has figured out how to marshal not only the technological resources, but the teaching resources to transform a sleepy, potentially sleepy, disengaged, uninterested group of students into an active, almost an active seminar that you wouldn't think could occur with more than 15 or 20. Here's another two galaxies that collided millions of years ago. And you can see that this looks a lot like our models. There's those little tails. What is so encouraging is it's not like Oz. It's not done behind the curtain. It's not done with smoke and mirrors. You can see what he's doing and you look at it and you say, I could do that. In fact, Tom Fleming learned to do that. 
When he began teaching in 1996, his classes looked very different. I just lectured, and they sat passively by and took notes, and then I gave them exams, and I assigned homework, and I'd have office hours where they could come in and ask questions about the homework. Were you trained as a teacher? No, not at all. Not at all. I was trained as a research scientist. All of my colleagues in the astronomy department are trained that way. Tom Fleming learned how to teach here. He got a week of teacher training and a free laptop computer. All right, so did you get a chance to talk with each other about this particular scenario? So what did you come up with? It what gave me a chance to meet instructors from the fine arts college, from humanities, from social science. And when I started to learn about some of the techniques they used and how I could use my laptop, to implement some of those, I decided to experiment with it. And of course, I, I'm, I'm a scientist and I'm a guy. I like toys. I like to play with technology. And uh, so for me, it was fun to, to try new gadgets in class. And I found that I was getting a greater response from the students. Two thirds of Fleming students report they study at least two hours a night. What's some of your observations and what do you all think? According to the university, nearly 35% of the faculty have come to the teaching center this year, either for advice or training, but participation is voluntary. I have faculty call and or privately share with me, it's tough, and I would really like to do or come to your workshop, but I don't have time, I can't, and I'm in the middle of a research project I've got to do. And some faculty have even shared with me, they'll say, now you know, Kathleen, that's not where the rewards are. Even though the University of Arizona paid for Tom Fleming's training and now pays him to teach other professors his techniques, he is not being considered for the ultimate reward, a lifetime job. In higher education, that's called tenure. Are you on the tenure track? No, I'm not. I am specifically paid to do this job by my department. Would you like to be on a tenure track? If you had asked me that question five years ago, I'd say yes. But as I see how things have evolved here for myself personally, I think I would say actually no. For me, the bottom line is the students. I, I seriously want them to have the best educational experience that is possible. Back at Western Kentucky, Brian Strau wants the best for his students too, but he also wants tenure. He will be judged on his teaching, his service to the academic community, and his research. The teaching requirement is somewhat uh, ambiguous. Uh, the community service is somewhat ambiguous as to what they want, but the research is pretty well spelled out. Uh, you will have, at a minimum, three peer-reviewed journals uh, or articles published where you will be fired uh, at the end of six years. There is a lot of pressure from the administration to engage in more research. Uh, clearly, if I want to raise, it's going to be through research. I'm going to do research if I want more money. It's not going to... I'm not going to get raises based on quality of teaching, no matter how good that teaching is. It's going to be, am I getting the articles published? I need to find, in the United States, the price, quantity demanded, quantity supplied. It was instilled upon me by other faculty that essay exams were not the way to go. Scarce resources. As an economist, I understand scarce resources. I can't publish and spend all my life grading essays. And so Brian compromises. In his introductory class, he does not assign a term paper, and his exams are mostly multiple choice, true, false, and fill in the blank questions. Uh, not quite. Well, here, I'll put the answers on the board so that you can practice for the final exam. If you have to do a lot of writing, you ask them for a three page or four page essay once a week. You do the arithmetic. Well, are you going to be able to set the bar as high as you'd like to if you're getting 200 papers a week to grade? And so what ends up happening is you end up asking less from your students, and they in turn expect less in the way of feedback, correction, help with style, etc. So those uh, all six parts uh, at the answer. Uh, I would want to know that for the final exam next Thursday. We need to elevate the status of teaching. We need to recognize that one of the most important things that our colleges and universities do is to teach students and to ensure that faculty are rewarded for being good teachers instead of being driven to publish, publish, publish or not get tenure because the result is that faculty don't feel like they have the time 
or the privilege of spending time on teaching. You have 30 seconds. Give me three specific ways the Federal Reserve can lower the money supply. In January 2006, Brian Strau will find out if he has earned tenure. What do you think your chances are? I think my chances are really good as long as I have my minimum three publications. And they are zero if I do not get my publications uh, in. Well, see, I was going to put the question. I got the question okay. above my other one. And then when I we met freshman Matt Morris, he was worried about a test he barely passed. See you Monday. All right. Bye. Bye. Matt is lucky. He's part of a living learning community at Western Kentucky. Freshmen live together, take many of the same classes, and study together. Like when you actually have a test, like there's 10, 15 other people that have the same test, same class. So you can go study with them. That's what I like about it. I study with a buddy. And then in astronomy, I do the same thing. Me and buddy study, study together. So I like it better just cause you can only study so much by yourself. But if you take what somebody else knows and you know, put it together, then it's worked for me so far. If students study together and they divide up their work and, and give one another responsibility for learning that material and then teaching it to one another, they learn at a deeper level. And that's something that I think is a benefit of any kind of group work. Interestingly, students in the learning communities seem to really gravitate toward that sense of family, the sense that someone's looking after you. And they register with me like we mean by summarizing and analyzing. Okay. What you're doing right now is telling me what the essay says, instead of just telling me what the content of the essay is. Well, I didn't understand. Does that make difference. sense? Yeah, it makes no. more sense now. Okay. On a campus with nearly 16,000 undergraduates, the smaller approach means Matt gets the help he needs. This particular assignment asked them to analyze an essay, and he wasn't familiar with analysis, but most of the students weren't and hadn't been asked to do this before, so it's a new skill. Learning communities don't cost more, but they require more work and cooperation on the part of professors. So you take personally every student's success, you tell them that on the way in, you make it very plain to them what it takes to succeed here, you expose them in the early weeks and months of college to the best teaching, and you hold them accountable by giving them assignments giving them feedback, creating some habits of the mind and the heart that will stand them well, not just through, through life. Matt finished the semester with a B average and now feels he belongs in college. Going home and going racing. Western Kentucky will open two more living learning communities in the fall, but still only a few hundred freshmen will benefit out of a class of almost 5,000. Many colleges and universities are experimenting with learning communities, but they're still fringe activities. Many are offering to help professors learn how to teach, but that training is entirely voluntary. The problem is we're sort of fond of innovations as long as they stay on the margins of our institutions, as long as they don't threaten the mainstream of the way we do our work. And if we are going to really capitalize on what we've been learning about how students learn best and how we can help them to succeed, we're going to have to threaten the status quo in the mainstream of our work. Every year, millions of students go off to college. For some, it's intellectually stimulating, a life-changing experience. But too many get lost in a culture that expects little. How we got to where we are today is a story of doors of opportunity opening and closing. It's a story about money. In Bowling Green, Kentucky, the day is winding down. Before she leaves, sophomore Salon Hollis is squeezing in a little last minute studying. How much time do you spend doing the homework, getting ready for the classes each day? Oh, um, I would say I spend maybe about a good three to four hours homework, getting things ready for them. You, you got to get it done to pass the course. For many students, it's time to relax, but not for Salon. 
I'm on a schedule every day, Monday through Friday. I have somewhere to be, either class, get home, get my homework done, and get in bed, go to sleep. My schedule is very tight. Because at 10 o'clock, I need to be waking up to get ready to go to work. That's 10 o'clock PM. Salon works the graveyard shift, as many as 48 hours a week, at a local automotive parts factory, where she earns $11.43 an hour. putting it in a, a bracket on the air filter. And then I put it in the machine and I hit the little lever. And what it does, the laser, it marks the part with a confirmation mark. And I and put it in the box. In one night, my quota is uh, between 500 and 700 pieces a night. You never know if you're gonna have any downtime or if any of the machines are gonna go down. You still have to try to meet that quota. Although Salon's family is middle class, she has to pay for college herself. My parents, they um, have always told me, because they've had financial problems of their own, so they've always told me since I was in high school that I needed to work and save my money for school and that they would try to help me out, but when I got to school, it didn't happen. Even working full time, Salon doesn't make enough to cover all her bills. When I first started college, I used to have credit cards, and that's what I used to pay my classes off with, classes and books. And I thought that I was gonna be able to get those credit cards paid off, but the, it just got bigger and bigger, and the next thing you know, that card was maxed out and I got another one in the mail. Between her credit card debt and loans, Salon could owe as much as $26,000 by graduation. And she's not alone. For 65% of American college students, going into debt is the new reality. It hasn't always been this way. Sixty years ago, public support was stronger. The government became a partner in higher education when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the GI Bill into law. The GI Bill was invented in post-World War II America as a way of dealing with large numbers of returning GIs and basically keeping them off the unemployment rolls. To get them off the streets and off of unemployment and uh, therefore back into college was one way to do that. There never was such a mass movement towards higher education. America weathered the crisis. Approximately two million veterans went to college, transforming not only their own lives and college campuses, but also changing public attitudes about higher education. Ordinary Americans learned that a college education wasn't just for the elite. It was within everyone's reach. Higher education became the highway to the middle class, built largely with federal and state funds. In 1972, the federal government opened the door to prosperity to the poor. It gave low-income students grants which did not have to be paid back, now called Pell Grants. The, the federal Pell Grant program had about three or four billion dollars in it, and it covered uh, over 95 percent of the average tuition at a four-year public college or university. Millions joined the middle class. Government helped those who couldn't afford tuition, and America prospered. The founding of our colleges and universities and a lot of the support that has come to them over the years is predicated on the idea that education is good for our citizens and that it helps people to have a better life. America had agreed to what amounted to a social contract, had agreed to help pay for everyone's college education, not just their own families. To keep tuition low, state legislatures supported their public colleges. The special role of the federal government was to provide scholarship help for the poor. All that began to change when research indicated that having a college degree added a million dollars to your lifetime earnings. In the last 25 or 30 years, since essentially the Reagan administration, since that 80s, we've decided that it's a private good, that because you benefit from going to college economically, you, your salaries go up. And so we've said, well, let the individual pay for it then. 
instead of recognizing that higher education also has major social benefits. Gradually, the social contract, the commitment to open higher education to all, began to fall apart. Government funding moved away from grants to low-interest loans. A Pell Grant, which once paid 95% of a student's tuition at a four-year public college, pays only about half the tuition today. To try to stay on top of her tuition payments and to apply for loans and grants, Salon Hollis meets with a financial counselor at Western Kentucky University. So you're still working full time? Yes, are, you, are you working 40 hours or more a week? Um, I'm working more than 40 hours a week. The average debt of a student that graduates from from the university four years ago averaged out just a little over 10,000, whereas this most recent year, four years later, it was as much as $20,000. So there seems to be a sense of, of panic a lot of times with students and with parents, especially when the bills go out and they realize um, they're not going to be able to meet the rising costs. And you have the dilemma of if they work and earn some money, they may not qualify as much for uh, financial aid in, in terms of federal financial aid qualifications. Yet if they don't work and qualify for the financial aid, that's not quite enough. That might pay for their education, but it doesn't allow them to have any kind of quality of life. Quality of life ends up taking a back seat to work. Today, 68% of all undergraduates work at least 15 hours a week. 20% are in salon shoes. So you have a full-time job as a student, a full-time job at a factory. When do you sleep? <laughs> I sleep, I sleep two hours here, go to class, come back, sleep two hours, do homework, sleep two hours. I, I sleep in and out all day like that. I never get to lay down for a good full six, seven hours like most people do. Do you miss class? Oh, yeah. I frequently do. When you are dead tired, you don't hear that alarm. I don't care how loud it is, you sleep right through it, and that's happened. There are limitations on the human experience and the brain. I mean, how much can you do with so little sleep? And we know the great, the, the, the downside of work is when students work off campus, they are less likely to persist for a variety of reasons. Are you missing out on some part of the college experience? I think I am. They have so many things going on on campus. They have guest speakers. They have events. You know, basketball games, football games. I can't go to any of them, you know? And I feel like that's a big chunk that's missing. You know, I would like to join a sorority, but I don't have the time. I got to work to get my tuition paid off. Salon will have to keep up this schedule for three more years to make it to graduation. For a fortunate few, money is not a concern. Jason Merrill had many advantages growing up and has used them well. He's having a very different kind of college experience. He's studying physics. I really just enjoy the logical puzzle of taking problems from step to step to step. And then when you finally arrive at the answer, you really feel a sense of accomplishment. A straight A student who scored in the 98th percentile on the SAT, Jason was offered a full scholarship to a top public university in his state but he turned it down to attend a private college, Amherst, in Western Massachusetts, where his education costs $40,000 a year. When you think about the money that you put into an Amherst college degree over four years, it's, it's a staggering economic investment. Not many people get the opportunity to have um, this type of education and this type of environment. Only about 3% of students, 400,000 out of 14 million, attend the most selective colleges and universities, which turn down at least two-thirds of those who apply. Jason's college, Amherst, with only 1,600 students and a billion-dollar endowment, can afford to focus on teaching and learning. One of the great 
benefits of a college of this size is you cannot be invisible. The, the fa a faculty-student ratio of nine to one or eight to one means that the faculty knows who you are. Do they actually overlap? Yeah, they do, right there. They do there, but if they're going in different directions. Right, so it doesn't really make any difference. Do you know professors outside of class? Yeah, um, especially in the physics department. Um, I know the professors pretty well. What does a student get for $40,000? The two things I think that you would get out of this place above all else is surrounding, being surrounded by extraordinary peers and being taught very, very well by teachers who not only teach well, but who are involved in their own scholarship. OK, Daniel, you're the governor of um, California, let's say. One of the things that is a privilege for me is the opportunity to teach an environment in which I can get to know the students, and the students know that I'm committed to them. I still think there should be more like facts and evidence to support You want more evidence? Yeah. My challenge in the classroom is to get my students to think and to think hard. Kevin, does that strike you as a plausible argument? What they know is less important than their capacity to think, to envision, to see beyond the horizon of what their views now are. Professors are well qualified and well paid. The average full professor earns $113,000 for teaching four classes a year. Jason Merrill is majoring in physics, but the liberal arts curriculum encourages him to explore new subjects like music and drawing. That's what a college education is about. It's about um, just expanding, expanding your horizons as, as much as possible while you have the chance. Amherst could fill the college with students like Jason, qualified applicants whose families can afford to pay $40,000 a year, but it chooses not to. Amherst College looks for students um, who come from privilege and from lack of privilege, because we believe that is part of our responsibility as an educational institution with the quality and the resources that we have. When Jason enrolled at Amherst, he picked one of the few colleges with the money and the commitment to uphold the social contract. Last year, Amherst gave out $21 million in financial aid, helping half of its students. The average amount of financial aid was $28,000. One of the recipients, T. Patterson from New York City. He's a senior with a musical gift. And athletic talent. In the last game of his college career, he helped Amherst beat arch rival Williams. It's the way to go out right there. You had to do it, got it done. There it is, it's been great four years. That's what I'm talking about. Came in together. His major is law, jurisprudence, and social thought. It's been challenging in, as far as stretching me out to think about things in different fashions and kind of uh, dig deeper to come to new understandings that I maybe didn't have before. His college years would have been far different if he'd had to depend on his federal Pell Grant. That free money intended to help low-income students averages $2,500 a year. Amherst costs 16 times that. The college makes up the difference for T and for the 16% of Amherst students who receive Pell Grants. Your home's in Harlem. Are there other bright young men and women like you back there who didn't get the chance that you've had? Yeah, there's plenty. There's, yeah, it's full. There's a ridiculous amount of uh, young men and women who aren't getting the same opportunities. Uh, I could definitely see where the country would be at risk to not, to just ignore that, that talent, that brilliance. For those who get the opportunity, success is almost guaranteed. 99% of students graduate from Amherst in four years. T. Patterson graduated in June 2005, owing just a few thousand dollars for his college education. A few wealthy colleges are following Amherst's lead and keeping the social contract alive. 
but only a few. I think the entire educational system of this country needs to be making a stronger case than we have made for why we, as a society, the government, private funders need to be investing in education in a way that we are not at this point, or, uh, or, or all the things that we hold dear are going to slip away. Where were you accepted? NYU, which was such a dream. I was dancing that day, floating in air, you know. You feel really proud because that's what you set out to do. It was my goal since I was 15. Adriana Villalba saw New York University, a selective, highly regarded private institution, as her chance at a top flight education. Her family moved to Denver from Mexico when she was 11, and her parents talked often about college. They both push for it, constantly telling us why we have to, you know, why we have to have a college degree. Why? Why is it important for us? Adriana excelled in high school. By the time I was done freshman year English, I was way above you know, anyone's expectations. I was correcting my English teacher. But when she was accepted at NYU, reality set in. Why didn't you go? Well, to ask my parents to pay such a high tuition just didn't seem fair. Adriana's parents make enough money to raise her and her three sisters, but not enough to pay $40,000 a year for four years. We're not, we're not rich. I can't ask them to take out so much money just to pay for my education. You hear all these counselors tell you all the time, there's so much money out there, you have to go and apply for these things. And they did offer me some money for, you know, a scholarship. And it really wasn't what I was expecting. Priced out of the top tier, Adriana enrolled at her local two-year community college where tuition is only $2,500 a year. Nearly half of all undergraduates go to community colleges. So here are the prisoners kept underground for their entire lives. Presumably I wonder, do you ever sort of wake up in the middle of the night feeling sad that, I mean, NYU is one of the best universities in the United it's States. It's an awesome school. I... And here you are at Community College of Denver. Are you ever sad about that? I do look back at it and just think, man, I worked really hard for that. And that just kind of, you know, left my hand really, really fast. But, you know, I just figured I'm just going to take this as a, just an experience and try to make the best out of it. When he goes outside and sees them, does he know that these are the illusions that they have on the wall? It starts to dawn. The minute he sees the copy... Who knows? Maybe NYU will look back. <laughs> maybe they'll say, oh, yeah, that's that one girl. Let's get her back. But this time, pay for it. <laughs> or at least help her out. For Adriana, community college offered the best opportunity to save money. Many of her classmates have no other choice. If you're low income and you go to college, you're more likely to be at a community college or maybe a regional state college, but most likely uh, at a community college. So. We didn't invent the American higher education system to have some kinds of colleges for people based on their money. It's supposed to be their talent, but it's more and more turning into that kind of a system. What is it? A bronco football. It's a bronco football? Yeah. I love it. When she was 14, Deborah Stake dropped out of high school and had a baby. I always wanted to go back to school, and I dreamed of having a degree, but it just wasn't. In the, it wasn't in the books for me right then at that time. I had to work, I had to provide for you know my boys and make sure that that was taken care of and I didn't have the option. All right, I'll take your shoes off, we can get your jammies on now. For 10 years, Deborah, now 29 years old, with four sons, has been working in daycare to support her family. She makes $10 an hour. I'm ready to go out, I'm ready to go out. In this field, it's a decent wage. It's not a thing to brag about which is why I'm going to school. There you go, honey. You all done? 
I have all the experience and the knowledge and the background, but without the degree, I don't get the higher pay rate. Last fall, she started college, but it's a struggle. Working part-time, she makes only $250 a week. Even with a Pell Grant, a rent subsidy, and a loan, she has barely enough money to afford community college. Community colleges provide America's open door to higher education opportunity. They are open admissions places where anyone who is willing to work can find a way towards their educational goals. Deborah wants a degree in early childhood education and is taking courses in remedial math, sociology, and English. But in general, what you want to do with a conclusion is a rhetorical sense that it's over. College really wasn't a part of my growing up. I mean, I know that my mom probably thought that it was important, and she sent us to school every day, but it really wasn't emphasized. It really wasn't, we never really saw how important it was growing up. You can accomplish it how? Saying in conclusion and yeah. then writing the letter. That's, that's a way to I do it. it. In conclusion of work? A little off. My English stuff is a little bit, it's a little bit challenging. I want to be the best in that class, so that's what makes it more challenging is my goal is I want to be the best. I want to be the best. If Deborah Stake makes it to graduation, she'll be beating the odds. Two out of every three community college students leave without a degree. Community colleges do have uh, lower persistence rates and lower graduation rates than four-year colleges and universities. In significant part, that's because they are serving more students who bring more challenges to college with them. Oh, big girl. Students who are working one or more jobs, 20 or more hours a week, students who have children so, and the like. Probably about once a week, I feel like giving up and so, I just, yeah. I'm stressed out and I'm tired and I have no energy and <sighs> so yes, there's been a few times I've threw a pencil across the room and just said, I give up, I'm done, I don't want to do this anymore. I want security for my kids, so that keeps me going. We take great pride in how many students get in and stay despite their personal circumstances and despite overcoming barriers that um, neither you nor I have faced. We really need you to, to help us out. Really President Christine Johnson is facing challenges of her own. The money CCD gets from the state has been reduced 30 percent. At the same time, her enrollment was increasing 30 percent. What, what keeps you awake at night? Budgets of just saying, okay, where do I cut? Who do I cut? And the impact that it has on both the, the students and the services will provide them and the individuals whose lives will be impacted by that decision. State policymakers in a crunch look around and say, who can we cut? And the answer often is higher education. And particularly because they see higher education as being the one entity that has the ability to raise revenue on its own through increased tuition and fees. The disappearing social contract has also hurt colleges, not just students. Nearly every state now gives its public colleges fewer dollars per student, meaning presidents have to find money elsewhere. You better either be in a campaign or you know, finishing one up or in one or planning one if you're going to survive in higher education today. Since 1999, the cost of running Western Kentucky University has increased nearly 70 percent. Enrollment has jumped 28 percent. During that same time, however, the state has reduced the amount of money it provides per student. How much of your time do you spend fundraising? Thinking about fundraising. Oh, thinking about it or doing it? Thinking about it, ooh, boy, most of the time. Um, 35, 40%. The state taxpayer support for public universities is eroding. That creates financial stress that we all understand, and we just manage it. We just deal with it the best we can. The Arizona legislature has cut Peter Lykins' budget nearly $50 million in four years. Today, less than 30% of the university's annual budget comes from the state. In order to compete successfully, you have to be able to raise gift money, and we've raised over a billion in this recent campaign. It will be on your exam. While the presidents are out looking for more support, 
Colleges are tightening their purse strings to try to balance their budgets. Are you well paid? No, no, no. My pay is a source of great, great discontents. Great, yeah. What's your, what's your salary? I'm making $65,000. Tenured professor? A full professor. Subsequently, factories started to lay off people, right? Because they have huge inventories. When, when we met Paulette Kurzer, she told us her unhappiness about her salary was affecting her performance. Do you ever say to yourself, I'm the professor, I am going to go the extra mile to help these students become better writers and thinkers? No, no, no. No, you can put it on the tape. No. Why? No. Why should I? I'm making $65,000. If not you, who? I don't see it as my task in life to give them the skills that they should have been taught years ago. I cannot do it. First of all, I cannot do it. How, how, how am I going to do it? How, how, how do you want me to make, turn them into better writers? I'm a political scientist. I'm not a writing composition expert. But why should I? Today I make somewhere around $29,000, $30,000 a year, uh, which is about the same amount I was making 20 years ago as a full-time uh, college professor. All set. Uh, Colleges and universities also try to balance their budgets by hiring part-time teachers. Bob Gibson is helping balance three budgets. Hi, everybody. I teach at this stage in my life uh, as many as 11 courses every semester. Today we're going to talk about feminism. Gibson teaches philosophy. This semester he has 280 students in nine classes at three colleges in the Denver metropolitan area. That was unimaginable to me when I began my career, when a normal load was four courses. This is not really the goal of a theory that is, that is a feminist theory. Many of Gibson's classes are at Community College of Denver, where part-timers do most of the teaching. It's a way of, of, of both managing costs and discontinuing programs that are, say, low enrollment programs. If, if we offer something and there isn't much demand uh, and it was a part-time person, then we just say, we don't need you this next semester. In order to build an ethical theory, you, you have to have goals and objectives. You but know, I don't like that. I don't like that we have two-thirds of our faculty who are part-time. I'm going to spend most of today with concerning feminist approach to ethics. Part-time does make sense from a business perspective. Um, you use it when you need it, you discard it when you don't. But education is not business in that sense, and it's not, it can't, you can't measure it in the same efficiencies that you can measure producing a product. Colleges may save money, but students pay the price. I've just completed my uh, third class of the day. I started at 8.30 with the Community College of Denver intro course. The time that one might spend in quiet solitude or, or talking with students in advising capacity just isn't there. They don't expect students to do as much of the activities as full-time faculty do that would contribute to deep learning. In other words, they don't necessarily um, ask students in assignments to draw from diverse perspectives, from different points of view, from different courses. Well, it stands to reason. They aren't part of the fabric of the institution. They wouldn't know what courses to suggest students draw from. They aren't part of that system. Perspectives that are uniquely male. Nationally, nearly half of all college faculty are part-timers, up from only 22% in 1970. Shuttling from campus to campus leaves little time for preparation. I'm pretty much an assembly line kind of a guy. The last theory is uh, a feminist critique of ethical theory. Uh, students, I realize this, but they learn pretty much the same kinds of things that students in other sections are learning, at other schools are learning, because they're using the same texts. They take the same exams. Do you see the assumption? So I wish I could tailor make my delivery 
and my tools for each class, for each student. Can't do it. Too many students, too many classes. And too little money to allow 63-year-old Gibson any thoughts of retirement. I'm still on the bottom of the barrel after virtually 40 years in the profession. Something's wrong here. I probably will be working uh, till the end. Should have a good idea of what comes and the way to make a good ethical choice. I don't think anyone really knows what's happened to education in the United States. Everybody wants their family members to be uh, college educated, uh, but no one seems to be able or willing to pay the price. At Western Kentucky, 42% of the faculty are part-timers, but that's not nearly enough to balance the budget. We get $75 million from the state, and our budget's $250 million. So that puts it in context right there. We've got to generate revenue from other sources in order to achieve the quality. That national prominence we talked about, uh, that doesn't come cheaply. More than ever, a major source of money is tuition. It's gone up on college campuses everywhere, 62% at Western Kentucky in four years. The price of higher education has gone up faster in the last 20 years than anything else in the economy except health care. Okay? So we measure it in each state in relation to family income in that state. And in almost every state, it's harder to go to college now than it was a decade ago. That is, it takes a larger share of your income uh, to go to college. And that keeps some high school students from going. 400,000 in just one year, 2002, according to a government report. We're moving toward a system where the only people who will have access to a college education are those who can pay for it. Hey, Tyler, my name is Blake, and I'm a student here at Western Kentucky University. Colleges are reaching out, looking for those who can pay for it or are willing to borrow. Ken. Hey, my name is Jessica, and I'm a sophomore at Western Kentucky University. How are you doing this afternoon? He's not interested. OK, well, do you know where he plans on going to college? Do you have an application to Western? Would you be interested in maybe getting one? They call it telecounseling, but it's just old-fashioned marketing. You get more students paying a high dollar amount, and you're able to do more things. Hello, may I please speak with Scott? In higher education today, the market rules. Students are customers, and colleges want more of them. You're able to invest back in facilities. You're able to invest in more faculty, higher credentialed faculty. Cash flow from more students at a higher price has given us capacity that without that enrollment growth, we would not have had. One way to attract paying customers is to look better than the competition. Western Kentucky has built academic complexes for its mass media, engineering, and biological science departments. It has renovated athletic facilities and dorms and put up a new parking garage. An addition to the student center and renovation of the football stadium are in the works. We're raising what I call the cool factor for our students, and, and it's paying off. Rebuilding the physical place ensures institutional self-esteem, pride among your constituents, whom you're asking for money, uh, the ability to recruit students. They want to be part of a place that's comfortable, clean, crisp, attractive, and cool. Across the country, college campuses have become building sites. Some of the buildings are for academics, some are not. Every college in this country faces spending more and more money on things that compete with the campus down the road or across the state in order to make sure they're not falling behind on those things that, quote, consumers are looking for. You have, do you have the best athletic facilities in the world? Do you, have, do you have swing pools? Do you have a spectacular student center uh, with McDonald's in it? Do you have residence halls that are at least the equivalent of the top-rated hotels? It's become an arms race, so you have to have what everybody else has. 
and what everybody else has may or may have anything to do with whether it's good for education. You can look at decisions made on campuses to build new gymnasiums and understand why college leaders are making the choices they're making. The pressures are very real, and the pressures are coming from students, from parents, from alumni, from trustees, from state lawmakers. And so all of the decisions on an individual basis make perfect sense. The University of Arizona is keeping up to try to help freshmen succeed. It spent millions creating this high-tech academic center where freshmen have access to computers 24 hours a day and can get tutoring and counseling. The university also built new dorms and a student union with a food court to rival any suburban mall. This is the reality. And when you are a university president, you deal with reality. We have to make choices. There is a limited pool of money that is available to fund the work of higher education, and that pool seems to be shrinking over time. And so the reality is that you can either build a new state-of-the-art fitness center on a college campus, or you can build a new state-of-the-art chemistry lab. You may not be able to do both of those. I sort of think of it in ways like you walk into a shiny new supermarket and it's got all the wheels and gadgets of a, a wonderful place, but the meat is spoiled and the milk is sour. You've got to attend to the fundamentals. Elite colleges are building just like everyone else. At Amherst, a new geology building is under construction. In the last five years, Amherst has rebuilt or renovated eight dormitories. This multi-million dollar sports center opened in 1999. Well, I can tell you that it's on the tour, that you know when people come to campus to see the campus, this is one of the things that they see. It's part of the culture now. And so everyone is looking for a place where they can go and be comfortable and work out. And um, so I think that that is a, a tool for, for recruiting here. It's an arms race, though. It's, a, it's an arms race, sure it is and we're gonna compete in that arms race, and we're gonna win in that arms race. Another way colleges attract tuition-paying students is by building up their academic reputations in the pages of popular guides like this one. We help people get the information they need to make smart choices. You know, knowledge is power. Millions use these publications to help them choose the right college. We say, using our criteria, here are the schools that did the best, the second best, the third best, all the way down. And I think that's very legitimate. I think it's helpful to people. Schools are ranked on SAT scores, alumni giving, student-teacher ratios, and graduation rates, among other factors. Do you think those rankings measure the quality of a college? I think academically, absolutely. But there's no measure of student learning. It's true, nobody really has come up with a successful measure of what students are actually learning in the classroom. I mean, there's, it's sort of the holy grail of, 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 of higher education and, and accountability. There's no evidence out there at the moment, objectively speaking, uh, that measures students in terms of what they've learned. Can you imagine for 200 years we've had a system in higher education in which we essentially rank schools on what goes in and not what goes out? I think for that you have to blame the colleges, not U.S. News. They're not printing inaccurate information, but they have, uh, they've driven the entire system of higher education like a group of lemmings over the cliff on this issue. And, uh, and it reflects one of the Achilles heel of American higher education, I think, which is that the, uh, we, we tend not to distinguish very well between quality and prestige. Flawed or not, ranking magazines are bestsellers, and colleges have figured out ways to climb. When you get a U.S. News World Report that ranks colleges uh, heavily by how selective they are and what their average SAT score is, um, you're going to then start saying, why not buy students who are going to make us look good? It's an enormously competitive environment. And most institutions, the Ivies are the rare exception, most institutions put money on the table to attract really bright kids. They came knocking on your door. They did. The Arizona schools and the schools in Oklahoma did yeah. that. 
It's a good time to be a student like Kara Munson, who is from Deming, Washington. Because of her strong academic record and high standardized test scores, the University of Arizona offered her a four-year full scholarship worth $78,000. Her roommate, Claire Brown, got a free ride and more. This year, beyond tuition, I got I think like $9,000 over the two semesters. And a big chunk of that was taken out for a room and board. But I got to keep all the rest. And that's what I'm using to travel abroad next year. You're making money going to college? Yes, I'm making a profit off of coming here. Claire and Kara, who were national merit finalists in high school, were offered what's known as merit aid to entice them to enroll. Their package came with other perks. You get to live in the honors dorm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, I don't that's know, I love it. basically where I've met all my friends is in yeah. the honors dorm. I'm so glad that I'm yeah. a part of the honors community. On a campus of 37,000 students, only 588 live in honors dormitories. Did you ever feel lost? No. And that's because of the honors dorm? Definitely because of the honors dorm. There are so many ways just to make it smaller, and the honors dorm is a way to do that, has been a way for me to do that. That year, the university enticed 56 other National Merit Scholars with merit aid packages. It's attracting students because you know that the quality of the learning experience depends upon the quality of the students in the class. That's a factor for everybody in the class. But honor students often get their own classes. Right, so anyone who doesn't have an exam? Eric Varnes teaches honors freshman physics. On this day, he was giving a quiz. Okay, so it's the usual deal, 50 minutes. You called this a lecture class, but you don't have 25 students. That's the big advantage for the students of being in the Honors College, this lecture class. It's an introductory freshman level. This is the first physics class they have at the university, and it's limited 20 to 20 students. If they weren't in the Honors College, they'd be in a lecture hall with 200 students or so. So and that's a big difference. Both Claire and Kara are earning high grades at Arizona. The university is not ignoring low-income students. It has substantially increased their financial aid, but it is emphasizing merit aid. It's using financial aid to get the kind of freshman class that you want, using it to meet the institution's goals to uh, create an image of itself as highly prestigious. Merit-based aid buys them but they're gonna go somewhere. Western Kentucky sent recruiting letters to all National Merit Scholars in the state last year and gave scholarships to the 10 who agreed to enroll. We want to recruit the valedictorians because other students follow. That's where we kind of focus our attention. And so far, things are working pretty well. We've grown by 4,000 students in the, in, since 1998. Nationally, merit aid has nearly quadrupled over the last 10 years. Today, some $8.8 .8 billion is handed out to high-achieving students because colleges want them. The price that, that you can expect them to pay for tuition is lower because they're in demand. It is not, to my way of thinking, a violation of any fundamental principles. It certainly is consistent with all the principles of economics. They're in demand. With our financial aid today, we're helping the people God already helped. And we are leaving behind people who truly cannot afford to participate in the system. One, one could call it enrollment management, to use the jargon, or one could call it incentives, to use the neutral word, or one could call it a bribe. It's not a bribe. It's, it is indicative of the fact that America in 2005 is more market-driven in every manifestation than it was 30 or 40 years ago. Nowhere are market forces in plainer sight than in the world of big-time college sports. Sold-out arenas, lucrative TV contracts, corporate sponsorships, and prestige money can't buy are all part of the game. When you have a good sports team, people know, like, people know your name's out there. There's so many schools in this nation that get no recognition because they don't have good sports teams. I mean, you never, never even heard of half of them. To score big, you need to sign the best student athletes. That's a whole other competition.
Andre Iguodala from Springfield, Illinois, was the prize many teams wanted. I always knew I was good at basketball since I was five or six years old. How many colleges wanted you to come play basketball for them? Uh, it was probably about 40 to 50 letters a day uh, from different colleges. Lute Olson, one of the most successful coaches in college basketball, won the competition for Andre and signed him for the University of Arizona. Coach Olson, this Hall of Fame coach. I guess we all think that if we put in the hard work and listen to Coach Olson, then maybe our dream will be fulfilled in playing professional basketball somewhere. Arizona gave Andre a full athletic scholarship, worth about $20,000 a year. From the first time he stepped on campus, the business deal was clear. The reason why I'm here is to play basketball. If we didn't play basketball, we wouldn't be here, and that's just the reality you have to face. But you say that. The reason I'm at Arizona is to play basketball. Does anybody say, hey, wait a minute, aren't you here to get an education? And that's also true, but if I didn't play basketball, I would not be here. Divide your time. How much is basketball and how much is academic? The majority of our time is spent right here on the hardwood. And whatever time we have left after that, we must you know, get our schoolwork done. Is it 75-25, uh, 50-50? Uh, oh, no, we're near 50-50. I say it's 80-20. 80-20. Yes. To nurture Andre's talent, he has one-on-one -on -one sessions with coaches and trainers and the use of a state-of-the-art gym that's for varsity athletes only. In addition to his classes, Andre's education includes academic advisors, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, and a computer center in the sports complex. Athletes are cosseted, they're coddled, they're given advantages that ordinary students aren't. Now, we like to think that sports is, is fair. We say the level playing field. May the best man win. But the fact of the matter is that in college and universities, sports are very unfair. What does the University of Arizona get for its investment? The year we met Andre, the basketball team generated $13.5 million in revenue. Four million goes to the basketball program. The rest of the pot, nine and a half million dollars, helps fund 17 other varsity sports on campus. Most university athletic programs don't do as well. Probably a dozen schools in the United States make a nice profit. Maybe another 30 or 40 break even. Everybody else loses money. Now, are, are we confused by that? Coach Olson reportedly earns over a million dollars a year through basketball, more than twice as much as the university's president is paid. You're going to have people who are going to make issues of that, and it's probably, it's probably right. But you know what? Uh, we've won more games over the last 16 or 17 years than any other team in America, and I'm not among the top 10 paid coaches in the, in the country. And that, it, it doesn't, that doesn't bother me. If I'd been interested in money, I would have been out of here a long time ago. Not many Lute Olsons around. And he doesn't get the kind of salary that some basketball coaches get. He's very, very well paid. He's very successful in what he does. And what he does has a high market value. Whereas it's an idiotic thing to suggest that a coach should make more than the school president, it's perfectly legitimate once we set up the model. In other words, we're going to say, we're trying to make money for the school by having successful basketball and football programs. Now, if you start from that premise, then you just simply go along the line and say, the way we do that is to get the best players that we can, and we get the best coach we can, and the way that we get the best coach is to pay them the most money. Despite his success on the court, Coach Olson understands it's a business. I know in basketball that if all of a sudden we weren't filling the arena here, I wouldn't have a job. I don't care if, if I'm in the Hall of Fame or anything else. By finding and developing major talents like Andre Iguodala, Arizona can continue its streak of profitable seasons. Do you ever say to yourself, hey, wait a minute, they're using me to fill these seats? 
Um, I think you can think like that. You know, I don't. And you think they're making so much money off of you. Like, uh, my jersey is in the bookstore. You know, they're selling for $60 a piece. I'm not getting a piece of that. And it's making money off of me. But um, I'm in a position where I'm playing for one of the best colleges in America. My coaches have told me I have the ability to play professionally. And they've had 20 some odd players in the NBA before. So they know who's good enough and who's not to play. And uh, I'm pretty sure that I have the chance to get there. So it's a fair deal. Uh, I don't think it's a, a exact fair deal, but that's the way we have. That's the best way you can look at it, and you just have to move on and just deal with it. Shortly after that interview, sophomore Andre Iguodala walked off the University of Arizona court for the last time. He dropped out of school and headed for the NBA draft. In the last 10 years, more than twice as many scholarship players at the University of Arizona have been drafted into the NBA as have earned diplomas. What does this have to do with the purposes of a university? Nothing. It has nothing whatsoever to do with education. Athletics are a goiter on the educational system, which is very, very visible, but has absolutely serves no purpose uh, uh, educationally. But Coach Olson believes sports provides a business model for higher education. I think what you're seeing right now is is what the wave of the future is. It's, it's the realization that you have to have commercial backing for not just athletics, but for business, for the uh, science department, for all of the other departments. The University of Arizona's contract with Nike is worth about a million dollars a year. $350,000 of that goes to Coach Olson. Athletics is one of the areas of higher education that's already gone too far. It's become so commercialized that now it's about corporate sponsorship, it's about winning teams, it's about selling jerseys, and we've lost something important in our athletic system. And it's a, a good example of where we could go with the entire system. I think it's sort of like sticking our head in the sand to say that, you know, we're going to be able to exist without the support of outside groups. Already 30% of the university's entire budget comes from outside contracts with private companies and government agencies. It's unreasonable and unrealistic to think that colleges and universities shouldn't partner with the private sector. They should. I, I think it's good for society to have those partnerships. But like anything, you want to think very carefully about how you structure that relationship. There's a lot at risk. We're, we're moving toward a system that doesn't function for the public anymore. The bargain Andre struck paid off. Following the draft, he signed a four-year, $9 million contract with the Philadelphia 76ers. We'll have people say, well, he should stay and get his degree. Right. I, I'm, I'm looking at a student, a student in business, let's say. And let's say IBM comes in and offers him a, a $15 million contract. He's, he's going to say, no, 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 wait now. I need to stay here and get my degree, and then I'll come. Uh, if it works out, I'll come in and work for you. It's, it's totally unrealistic. Back in Kentucky, Salon Hollis, who's still struggling to get through college, is on her own. She's making $11.43 an hour working the night shift and going to Western Kentucky University during the day. If it weren't for me going to school, then I will have, I'll probably have to work here for the rest of my life. And some people have been here for a long time. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I cannot wait to the day that I give my badge back to Franklin Precision Industries and I get out there in the business world with my business suit and, like I said, my office, my secretary. I want it all like that, you know. That's how I picture myself. Salon shift ends as the sun rises. I'm tired. I just want to sleep now, <laughs> but I know I can't. I got to study for class. Are you under pressure? I am under pressure. I feel as though if I don't get things done, I'm going to fail. You know, just because you work, the teachers don't cut you any slack at all. 
So it's stressful, and very stressful. Salon's juggling act collapsed in the spring of 2005. Exhausted, she transferred to community college. She joins people for whom community college represents the best and often the last chance at achieving the American dream. Okay, Claudia, this is 150. Thank you. By working part-time and living at home, Adriana Villalba has nearly earned her two-year degree and will graduate debt-free. She hopes to continue at a four-year college. Deborah Stake's school year was more difficult. She got married and her housing subsidy was reduced, but her husband's income wasn't yeah. enough to make up the difference. Strapped for money, just three weeks before the end of the second semester, Deborah dropped three classes and went back to work full time. She hopes to save enough money in the summer to return to CCD in the fall. The loss of the social contract hurts the poorest students and the poorest institutions the most. Community colleges, the place of last resort for many, have been forced to turn away students, over 200,000 in just two states, California and Florida. It's not right. Uh, America has always been about opportunity and promise and hope. And that was the agreement between generations, and that was the agreement from the previous generation to our generation, and it's, a, it's the promise we owe this next generation. Are you saying we're breaking it? We're breaking it. graduation day and I feel really nervous and excited and I feel like I made a big accomplishment. I'm looking forward to becoming a part of society. <laughs> Actually having a you know a working job and making an actual income and not being not having to focus on two things a student and a job. I'm a first generation uh, fourth year graduate from my family so I had a lot to live up to and I'm happy that I accomplished it. Well, good kiddo. Joseph Hanlon. Even as college students take the walk across the stage that transforms them into college graduates, Adam Ambus Harper. There are troubling statistics that cannot be ignored. About half of those who start college never make it to graduation, and many who do leave college heavily in debt. I'm very in debt, about forty thousand dollars. Let it be known. Did they get the education they paid for? How can we make sure they do? How do we open the doors for hundreds of thousands who've been left out and help those who are struggling to stay in? How do we reward good teaching? Miracle our Cruz. And how much time do we have? I feel anxious. I feel excited. I feel The system is at great risk, and we don't have the liberty of waiting to see what happens. We have to stop now. We have to have this conversation now about what does society need from higher education. I worry that 10 or 20 years from now, we'll look back and be amazed by what was lost. Higher education is about the future, and it's, it, is the, it is the way in which we travel to the future in terms of being prepared or it's the way in which we fail the future. All you have to do to really understand this is to read that fine print in the bottom of your mutual fund prospectus where it says past performance is no guarantee of future results. And you will know what our challenge and predicament is in higher education today. We spent two years on college campuses and what we saw is disturbing. The future does not look bright. The country needs a renewed social contract so that anyone with talent and determination can go to college. And colleges need to pay more attention to teaching and learning. We don't have much time. Because while American higher education is declining, much of the industrialized world is moving up fast. Thank you.
Principal support for this program was provided by Lumina Foundation for Education. Additional support was provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with additional funding provided by Park Foundation, Christian A. Johnson Endeavor Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and the Spencer Foundation.